Well, hey there, and welcome to The Bridge Online. If you're new here with us, my name is Chris, and I am thrilled that you have decided to tune in today. And if you're tuning in on Sunday, be sure to hit the New Here button on your screen. We'd love to get to know you and send you a free gift as a way to say thank you for taking the time to check us out. Well, today we're starting a brand new series called At The Movies. This has become a bit of a summer tradition around here. While this year certainly looks a little bit different with the pandemic, summer is usually the time when big blockbuster hit movies hit the local theaters. So for this series, we'll be having some fun using movies to illustrate biblical truths. But before we do that, we're gonna to go to the band for an amazing song called House of the Lord. As many of you know, last Sunday was our drive-in prayer event. 
It was so wonderful to see so many of you and get to gather together to pray and really dedicate the next phase of the bridge to the Lord. Thank you to all of you who showed up and thank you to all who took the time to pray at home. Please keep praying for the bridge as we look to relaunch our Kanata campus and we continue to build irresistible bridges between the unchurched and Jesus. As we look to relaunch our Kanata campus, there are just a lot of things to be done around here and we need you. One of the things that needs to be done is to patch up some walls. So if you can handle a drywall compound and, and, some, and a putty knife, please go to bridgechurches.ca slash serve to join our team. Well, as part of our At The Movie series, every Wednesday on our social media, that's Facebook and Instagram, we will have some movie-related game or trivia or activity that you can participate in. And everyone who participates will be entered in to win a weekly prize. So if you have not done so yet, be sure to like us on Facebook and follow us on Instagram so you too can participate. Lastly, I want to take a moment to thank all of those who give financially to the bridge. Because of you, we're able to run the bridge online. Because of you, we're able to launch a Kanata campus better than ever. Because of you, we have kids from all over participating in our, local, in our virtual kids camp. My daughter has told me repeatedly that she loves Sunday mornings. In fact, it is her favorite day of the week. And that's in large part to Lisa and her amazing team. But it's also because of your generosity. So thank you. If you'd be interested in donating to the, the, the mission and vision of the bridge, just go to bridgechurches.ca slash give to find out the ways you can donate. All right, let's go back to the band for a wonderful song called Who You Are To Me. Oh yeah, some people think you're distant, just some words on a page. That you're nothing more than fables handed down along the way But I've seen you part the waters Where no one else could pull me from the deep It's who you are to me Some people think you just live In cathedrals made of stone But I know you live inside my heart I know that it's your home And I've seen you in the sunset Everybody does And I wonder when I stumble Am I still worthy of your love? But I know that I get stronger When I'm talking to you down on my knees You're everything I need You're amazing, faithful Love's open door When I'm empty You fill me with hunger for more Of your mercy, your goodness Lord, you're the air that I breathe. 
All right, well, we have a lot more of announcements to mention around here, so buckle in and get ready. All right, I know you don't want any more announcements. What you want is a moment with the man, the myth, the legend, Paul Perry. In other words, PP. Those are your initials, right, Paul? Those are my initials. Awesome. Well, what we're going to do right now, because we're beginning this series called At the Movies, what we're going to do today is we are going to have a challenge called I Crushed Paul. And what we're going to do is we are going to phone somebody up on the phone. Remember those things, the telephone where you actually talk to people? We're going to use that and we're going to call someone and have three movie questions, Paul. Okay. And they're going to have the opportunity to answer the questions first. And then we're going to bring you back in and you're going to have the opportunity to answer the same three questions. And if you win, well, Paul, you are our resident movie expert around here and television too. Like if it's on a screen, I know it. You know it. I know. So it. we're going to do that right now. So, Paul, we're going to send you off into a soundproof booth and I'm going to call up our first contestant. And you may know this contestant. He uh, hosts our online service every Sunday at the 915 service. His name is Rich Danby. And I'm going to call him right now and get him on the line here. Hey, I'm looking for Rich Danby. Is this him? This is. Oh, Rich, it's great to have you on the line. You are here for the game I Crushed Paul. Are you ready? Sure. All right, Rich, what we're going to do is I'm going to ask you three movie trivia questions, and you're going to obviously see how many of them you can get right. If you win the contest against Paul, you will win a movie prize pack that will be delivered to you. If you don't win, all of your prizes are going to be thrown in the wood chipper. Are you ready? I am ready. All right. Now, this is unscripted. This is live, and we are ready to go. So here's the first question, Rich. What was the first feature-length animated movie ever released? Toy Story? Uh, I'm sorry. That is not the right answer. The answer we're looking for is Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. All right. Mm. You should have known that. You were around for that, weren't you? Yeah, I was. That's my bad. Yeah, all right. Number two. For what movie did Tom Hanks score his first Academy Award nomination? Not win, but nomination. Big? Oh, yes, that's exactly right. Big, that's the answer. Well done. Oh, Rich, oh, that's awesome. Hey, let yourself know in the chat how proud you are of yourself. All right. I'm extremely proud. All right, number three. What was the name of the skyscraper in Die Hard? I have nothing. No idea. You come on. You love Christmas movies. You must know this one. That's true. I am Mr. Christmas, but I have nothing. Oh, all right, Rich. Well, the answer we were looking for is the Nakatomi Plaza. So unfortunately, you only got one of three correct, but that's okay. That's the average. But I don't know if it's going to be enough to beat uh, Paul Perry. So we're going to bring Paul back in. Paul, come on back in. He's. Uh, I'm just motioning to him from the sound booth room, I'm bringing him back in. Okay, Paul, you're on the line with Rich Danby. Rich, you're going down. <laughs> mm, probably. <laughs> probably. Okay. I like, I like that answer. So, that's good. Paul, Rich got one out of three correct. Okay. Okay, so that's okay. the average, but I, you're above average, aren't you? Absolutely, I'm above at, average. At most things, anyway. Okay, here we go. You ready? What was the first feature-length animated movie ever released? Oh, that look isn't good. Snow White? That is correct! Okay. <laughs> oh, I told you, Rich, you're in trouble. You're, you're going against the pro here. Okay, so we got one to one here. Number two, for what movie did Tom Hanks score his first Academy Award nomination? Not win, but nomination. Days of Thunder. Tom Hanks wasn't in Days oh, of Thunder? I know you did. I was thinking Tom Cruise. Oh, oh man. Oh, that was, I was thinking Tom Cruise. Okay, well that is oh. the wrong answer. Oh. And, and I don't think he would have got any nomination no. for that. Okay, the answer we were looking for there was oh. big. Oh. All right, number That's three. So well, number three, this is for all the marbles. And if you get this wrong, Rich wins the tiebreaker because he's our contestant, not our resident pro, and you should be better at this. I should be. So, number three. What was the name of the skyscraper in Die Hard? 
<sighs> Come on, Paul. You love Christmas. It is I do Christmas love it. Is, absolutely, it's a Christmas movie. It is a Christmas movie. Uh, it's the, it, has, it was like Japanese sounding. Uh, Nakatomi Plaza. That is the right yes! answer! Yes! Oh! Yes! <laughs> yes! <laughs> Yes! Oh, Paul Perry for the win. Rich, I'm sorry. All your fabulous prizes are going in the wood chipper. I'm really sorry about that, brother. That's okay. All right. Congratulations, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Give yourself your condolences in the chat, okay, Rich? Will do. Thanks, guys. All right. Thanks a million. Well, there you have it, everybody. Paul Perry, his... I guess your record is secure. Uh, we're going to have to come back next week to see if we can find another contestant that can beat PP at At The Movies Trivia. We'll see you next time. A vending machine? Well, not just any vending machine, Private. The last remaining home in America's nanny state for those succulent but chemically hazardous bits of puffed heaven cold. Oh, cheesy dibbles. Happy ding dong birthday, you little scamp. Oh, oh, oh thank you. <laughs> you mess with a bull, you're gonna get the horns, Private. Now hit that machine and get your present. just broke into the most secure facility in North America. You know what that means? We're wanted criminals who'll be on the land the rest of our lives? Always feeling the hot breath of Johnny Law on our necks? No, it means, as elite units go, we're the elitist of the elite. Top shelf in the Bureau, the penultimate. Plus one. Where'd Private go? Oh, well, there he is. D3. Oh, Private. How much is he? He's $3.50, sir. Oh, that's outrageous. Even for Private. <laughs> sir, the machine is alive. <laughs> I don't think I like your attitude, vending machine. Or your prices. Release them. <laughs> what the? What the? What the? Ah! Well, hey everyone, my name is Jeremy. I'm one of the pastors here on staff and I'm so excited to be able to join you uh, for this series I'm gonna be doing this week and next week. And I'm just so excited to be able to do this at the movie series where we watch a few clips and then we just pull out some truths and have a conversation about them. So the, the, the movie that we just watched together, the clip that we just watched together was from a movie called Penguins of Madagascar. And let me tell you, if you haven't watched it yet, if you haven't done it yet, do yourself a favor, do it tonight. Have a family movie night. I mean, watch it yourself. I watched it myself. It is absolutely great. So the scene that we pick up on is before that, you see that these penguins have created this absolutely elaborate plan to break into Fort Knox. And I mean, they execute this thing to perfection. And so they, they, they do all these things and it's just amazing. They're all jumping and flying. And, well, they don't fly, but you know what I mean. They, they look, it looks like they're flying, but they're penguins. So they get in there and then we pick up on this scene and we realize that they're not there to steal gold, which is what you would think. They're there for cheesy dibbles. And, and we catch them at the shining moment the culmination of all of these grand plans and the result is in front of them. But then in the blink of an eye, the circumstances change. In the blink of an eye, all of their plans are off the rails. One by one, the penguins get sucked into the cheesy dibble machine and then suddenly it's out the roof and, and psh, gone. An important thing there, but I'm gonna to talk to you for a second about puzzles. So I wonder, are you a puzzle person? Some of you out there are puzzle people. You love puzzles, I mean, it's your jam. And, and listen, I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm not a puzzle person, right? Like I get, I do not have the attention span to do puzzles. I get distracted so, oh sorry, I thought it was a squirrel. <laughs> no, just kidding, listen. I get so distracted that I, there's no way I could, I could put the time and energy into a puzzle. Plus, 
I mean, just ask my wife and the amount of times that I ask her to find things. I lose things all the time. I am so absent-minded, and I know I would lose a piece, and if I, if I manage to have the attention span long enough, I get to the end and be like, okay, I'm missing pieces, this is stupid. But some of you are, are mass, I mean, you've got that mat that you, you build puzzles on, and then you can roll it up and keep it for later so it's safe, right? I know that there are some of you out there like that. So imagine with me for a moment, you've got this giant puzzle, and you're ready to build it, but there's a catch, and the catch is, you don't have the box cover. There is no point of reference. There is no frame of reference. But because you're a keener, you jump in. And you do what all, what I'm told, all good puzzle people do. You find the edges. You find the corners. You build that frame out. You sort out the colors. And, and, you, and then you start, you get stuck right in. And you're, and you're doing, you're sailing. Boom, boom. All the pieces are going in. And then suddenly you pick out this piece and you're like, what? What? This piece doesn't fit anywhere. This piece doesn't make sense. This piece doesn't go with what I'm building. I wonder, sometimes you're faced with things in life that are just like that puzzle piece. Whether you're from the church or not, whether you follow Jesus or not, I know that there are times in your life where you're looking at a circumstance or an experience or an event and you're looking at it and you're looking at it, it's like that piece of the puzzle, and it doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit anywhere. In that moment, you're likely like, you have, you, you have more in common with those four penguins when, when all of their plans went off the rails. When everything that you've figured out and established and planned and written down, it's in your calendar, suddenly it just, you might as well wipe it out. Suddenly you're left holding a piece that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Well, over the next two weeks, we're going to be talking about the theme for, for, for me is when life doesn't make sense. I'm going to use a, a movie clip this week and next week and, and that, that challenges us in this, in this topic, in this theme. I'm going to do two questions. First question is, what do we do when life doesn't make sense? And then next week, when I'm back, where do we go when life doesn't make sense. And I think, I think there are just such, there's such profound questions for me in my experience these last two years as I've wrestled with these things. And, and I believe that God has shown me some things in, in the Bible that, that he wants you to hear, he wants you to know, he wants you to wrestle with as well. So I invite you to just join me and, and, and stick with this and just as we explore. So this week, we're going to look, what do you do when life doesn't make sense? And perhaps as you, you think about that question in your homes or wherever you're watching this, there, there is a list of things that maybe come up. When you're faced with something that doesn't fit, when you're faced with something that doesn't go according to plan, when you're faced with an experience or a situation or an event, Perhaps you think of things, of, of what, what you do in that situation. And perhaps for some of you, it, there's some positive things that you would do. There's some positive outlets. There's some positive patterns and habits that you've formed to help you manage these moments of confusion, these moments when things don't make sense. But perhaps some of you are thinking of things, other things that are negative, Perhaps there are things that you have gone to, that you have attached yourself to, or that you're doing that are, are negative, that try and numb the experience, or the situation. Because you don't know how to answer this question, so you don't want to think about this question. And so maybe it's substances, or maybe it's activities, or maybe it's something just as a distraction. You're trying to escape from it. But I believe that God speaks profoundly into this question. He's done it in my life. Because there's been moments where, where things don't make sense. And that's what we're going to explore today. So we're going to look at Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 40. And it's this really cool uh, you know, situation that, that I hope, that I've learned from, that I hope you learn from in the life of Jesus. Now, some context. Jesus has been doing ministry. He's been doing things not for a long time. He kind of just come on the scene. He's a carpenter's son, and, he, and he's, he's called these men to, be, to follow him. And they've left family. They've left friends. They've left professions to follow him. And they have witnessed him do incredible things. And not only them, but crowds of people. I mean, the word spread. 
on their social networks. Hey, you got to check this guy out. Come on. And there's these just giant crowds that would follow him and he would speak to these crowds. He would say things that that were were different and 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 to some people strange and to some miraculous and he would do things that just defied belief. And so people followed. Not only the disciples and the disciples are what we call followers of Jesus. It's a, it's a word in the Bible that, that means follower of Jesus. So the disciples follow, but also all of these people. And so we pick up on the story after a really long day, like a really long day with lots of people. And, and this is what it says in verse 35. The same evening, Jesus suggested they cross over to the other side of the lake. And we're just going to stop here for a second. We're going to park here for a second because so often as we read through the Bible, we can skip over things. I know I can. But there's a promise here. There's a promise here that plays into what happens later. The same evening, Jesus suggested they cross over to the other side of the lake. Now, in other translations, I mean, if you're new to church or the the Bible, the Bible was originally written, Old Testament was in Hebrew, New Testament was in Greek, and there's all kinds of different uh, English translations. There's all kinds of translations of the Bible, but there's many translations in English. So when I say uh, different translations, I mean other English translations um, kind of word this differently. And so other English translations word this, you know, instead of suggesting, they say, Jesus said, let's go to the other side, kind of matter of fact kind of a throwaway line, right? And I'm sure the disciples are like, yeah, okay, sure. Especially so, so many of them are comfortable on the water. They're like, okay, yeah, let's go to the other side. Let's get in the boat. Let's go. It's no big deal. But there's a promise here, right? And we, we don't want to forget this as we walk through and see what happens. There's a promise that in the destination. Verse 36, with Jesus already in the boat, they left the crowd behind and set sail along with a few other boats that followed. Okay, so there's a whole crowd of them. And they're going, as anticipated, as expected. You get in the boat, you sail the boat across the sea, we get to the other side. And yet something happened. Verse 37, 37, as they sailed, a storm formed. Now, I'm going to stop there for a second because, listen, they're on the Sea of Galilee. And a storm forming on the Sea of Galilee was normal. This wasn't an abnormal experience. The way the the hills are, how low uh, the the Sea of Galilee is in in the surrounding geography, the the hills, the the hot air coming off the desert. Like, you know, I I mean, there's probably more people out there that know more than I do about this. But but the storms are normal. They're a common occurrence. And yet there's something different about this storm. Other translations, as I mentioned, other translations say a gale force wind or a windstorm picked up. I mean, this, this storm was no joke. The winds whipped up huge waves that broke over the bow, filling the boat with so much water that even the experienced sailors among them were sure they were going to sink. Yeah, so this is, this is, this is a big deal, right? It's not just a little waves. This is, this is they were afraid, you know, even the experienced sailors. I don't know about you. <laughs> I mean, I don't know about you. But when the people who know what they're doing are scared, then I'm scared. Like, not just a little bit scared, like, really scared. Because they know what they're doing and they're scared. A while ago, um, a long while ago, um, I, was, I had the opportunity to take a, a group of graduating uh, students uh, to a, on a whitewater rafting trip on the Ottawa River. And if you haven't done that yet, as soon as they open that up, go for it. It is an absolute blast. The Ottawa River is such an incredible place. And so we're all happy in this place, except for, for him. He's kind of shell-shocked. But listen, it was a great trip. And, and on the Ottawa River, there's a, a number of, of really big rapids that you do, different sets of rapids that are super fun. Um, on, and in this, in this trip, there was a, a wave that we did called Center Slot. And Center Slot was like what you call a, a, pour, a pour over. It was like this lot of volume of water going over this, kind of quite a, a sharp decline. And then it, it hits, and the green water kind of goes underneath and it forces up all these bubbles. Kind of looks like a, a washing machine or a bubble bath, right? And, and like it, what you do is you go down it and then you bring the boat back up and you kind of park the boat sideways and you just kind of, it holds you there, right? Because the water is circling back. Now, it's super fun. And I, I know there's some of you out there who are like, nah, no, nah, that's not fun. But it, it was. But, but something happened on this trip that caused me concern. So we're, we're, we're sitting there. We're, we're having a blast. This young woman here, Hannah, she fell off on the wave side. So she fell off into the fast-moving green water. 
But I just saw her feet whoop, over the side of the boat. And I'm like, uh, like, uh, I'm in charge of these kids. And one of them just disappeared. And so I look over at this man here, who is our guide. And, and same smile. He's laughing, having a great time. So I'm thinking, okay, I guess it's normal. She's, she's gone. I can't see her. She didn't pop up right away. Uh, yeah, haha, <laughs> okay, let's keep having fun. Looked at him, looked at the water, no Hannah. Looked at him, looked at the water, no Hannah. Looked at him, still smiling, no Hannah. Looked at him, still smiling, looked at the water, Hannah popped up. He was an experienced guide on the Ottawa River. Looking at him, I had confidence that she would pop up and she would be okay. Because there was no panic. That is not the situation that is going on here on the Sea of Galilee with the disciples. Can you imagine being the other disciples on the boat? The ones who were not experienced fishermen. There were four experienced fishermen that left that life to follow Jesus. And the experience on the Sea of Galilee, they would have seen storms. They would have experienced storms. They would have had the skill set. But when the professionals are freaking out, you know there's a problem. And in this moment, in this situation, with Jesus on the boat in the Sea of Galilee in this storm, there was a problem. And what happens next? Jesus was in the, in the stern of the boat, sound asleep on a cushion when the disciples shook him awake. Now, listen, there's something I want to touch on really quick. It's, it's, it's just an aside, but, but some of you are watching today and you're looking for someone, anyone, who can understand what it is that you're going through, what it is that you're experiencing, what it is that you are feeling. And, I'm, and I want to tell you today, that Jesus is that person. Have you ever been so tired that you could sleep anywhere? I remember when we had our, our first child, uh, Nevea. Man, she was, she, I love her. She was a tough baby. She was the kind of baby where, like, you had to, I had to hold her, and I had to do the bounce thing, and I had to do the walk and bounce, walk and bounce, walk and bounce. And I don't know what was inside of her that, that she knew. She could be sound asleep in my arms, like, 3 o'clock in the morning, and I bounced for an hour. And then I start, I go over to the rocking chair, and I slowly, like, I mean, parents in the crowd, you know, like, you're slowly, you're like, okay, come on, all right, slow. And there was this point, as I was sitting down into the chair, that she would be like, boom, she'd be awake. Just like that. I'm like, how did you even know? I was moving so slow. And then I'd have to start bouncing. Man, there, I had, there was times where I, I slept on my desk. I mean, I could lie down on a, on a gravel driveway and fall asleep because I was so tired. Right? Jesus was sound asleep. He had had a busy day. He had had a number of moments where he was speaking publicly, where he had, he had done things. There were crowds of people. You're looking for someone who understands what it's like to be you. You're looking for someone who understands what it means to be human. You're looking for someone who understands your experiences, your, your emotions, your sense of whatever it is that you're experiencing. And I'm here to tell you today that it's Jesus. Jesus walked in our shoes. Hebrews says that, that he is someone who has empathy with our human condition. He understands because he was human. John, the book of John says that, that he moved into the neighborhood and he became one of us. And so if you're looking for someone who understands, I'm telling you this morning, Jesus understands. But in that moment, the disciples are like, not, they're not you know, amazed by the reality that the fact that Jesus is asleep in the boat, right? They are say, they are, they're like, we're going to die. <laughs> we have lost control. We are going to die. Shouting over the storm, Jesus, master, don't you care that we're going to die? I am so thankful that that question is recorded in this experience. Because I wonder, have you ever asked this question because I know I have maybe you're asking it this week maybe you're looking at your circumstances or your experience maybe you experience loss maybe maybe you're in the middle of a storm maybe this you're this is your first time at church and you don't even really even know if God exists but you still have turned your eyes up to the sky and you said don't you care don't you care 
Don't you care that I'm living this or experiencing this or going through this? Don't you care about me? And sometimes the silence is so deafening because it feels like Jesus is asleep in the boat. There have been times in my life where I have walked outside and I have looked up and I have yelled into the sky. God, don't you care? Don't you care? Don't you care? And I know, at least at some point in your life, each of you have felt that or thought that or wrestled with that, the emotion of that moment, the emotion of that question. And so I am so thankful that that is there because I feel like I can resonate with the disciples in that moment. Especially in this moment, because what is the real issue here? They've lost control. These disciples, some of them had a really set of skills that could handle these types of situations. But the skills were no match for what happened, for the circumstances they found themselves in. And perhaps there's some of you here today, perhaps there's some of you watching, where all of your skills, all of your gifts, all of your ability to plan and, and manage, all of those things are meaningless in, in the light of your circumstances. You have lost control and you don't know where to turn. And maybe you ask, don't you care? And so the disciples turn to Jesus and say, don't you care? They could no longer handle the situation and they turn to Jesus and they say, don't you care? 39, he says, it says, he got up, shouted words into the wind and commanded the ways before anything else. His answer to the question is action. His answer to the question is action. He got up. He didn't stand on the boat and be like, yeah, guys, of course I care. Let me tell you about how much I care as you still are afraid we're going to die. No, he got up and he shouted words into the wind. It goes on and says, Jesus said this, that's enough, be still. And immediately the wind died down to nothing. The waves stopped. Do you care? Yeah. Let me show you. Let me show you how much I care. I will do something to demonstrate that to you. And we see at the conclusion of this story at the end of Mark, Jesus shows through action how much he loves and cares for each one of us. By dying through Roman crucifixion, through suffering, through pain, unlike people had seen, really. He gave his life so that we could live. He gave his life so that we could be free from the bondage of sin. He gave his life. We look up to the sky and we, we, he allows us to yell that question, do you care? And then he reaches out his hands and shows us the nail holes in his hand. He said, I care. So in this moment, the first thing that he does is he acts. That's enough. Be still. It, it, it reminds me of those moments uh, when I'm camping or if you're a cottage person, you wake up early in the morning and the water is just like glass. It could be a mirror. It's just calm. Can you imagine going from like, we're going to die, we're going to die, to calm, perfectly calm. He stepped into the reality and he demonstrated that he cared. His answer was unexpected and miraculous. Later on, they were still freaked out. They're like, who is this guy? Right? Like, who is he? They, the, even the wind and the waves obey him. Jesus says this, and this is, I think, important for us today. How can you be so afraid after all you've seen? Where is your faith? How can you be so afraid, he says? How can you let fear dictate to you the way you think or the way you act? In this moment, fear, they were prisoners to the fear. And he's saying, how can you be so afraid? Why? Why? Because of what they saw. Now remember, the promise was the destination, not the journey. Verse 35, let's go to the other side. There was no guarantees that the journey would be uneventful. We can see it's anything but that. It was very eventful. But the destination was still there, the promise to reach the other side. But what did they see? Well, up until this point, they, they left everything to follow Jesus. 
And they saw him do incredible things. He demonstrated time and time again that he had power over the physical realm through healing. And he demonstrated again, again and again and again that he had power over the spiritual realm by casting out demons. And in this moment, he also shows that he had power over the wind and the waves. I wonder, for those of you who are Christians here today, those of you who are followers of Jesus, who are disciples of Jesus, what have you seen? I'm going to, I'm going to be straight up honest with you. There are times in my life when I have to recall the things and the moments and the times that God has stepped into my reality and been there for me because in the moment, all I see is storm. I have to remind myself of the faithfulness of God, either through prayer or reading scripture or remembering those times that God showed up. Those times when he took the pain and he took the confusion and he took those moments in my life that didn't make sense and he made beautiful things out of them. So what have you seen God do in your life? As you face situations or experiences, as you hold that puzzle piece and you're like, what is going on? Maybe you're like the penguins being like, we had plans, but they're not working the way we thought they were. And in that moment, in that moment where you're, you're feeling so viscerally that, that God, do you care? Remember and remind yourself of the moments in your life when he showed his care for you. Remind yourself of the stories of the gospels where he showed that he cared for you. Remind yourself that he died for you. Now, perhaps you're joining us and this is your first time. You're like, I don't even know why I'm watching this today, but I'm here and I haven't seen God do anything. In fact, I've seen the opposite. I've seen the absence of God in my life. I'm having trouble hearing you. Oh, Siri's having trouble hearing me. I hope that you are hearing me okay. Listen, there are moments that maybe you're like, I haven't seen anything. No, she didn't hear me that time. But, but listen, I encourage you to check God out, man. Check God out because God wants to do great things in your life. He wants to take all of those moments, all of those times, all of those experiences, and he wants to tell you that he loves you. He reaches out his hand in those moments and said, listen, I love you so much. I died for you. If you believe in me, you will have life, not just normal life, not just everyday life, abundant life. Life that transcends experience, life that transcends circumstance, hope that transcends our reality, hope that goes beyond what we are in the moment, hope that is more than a confusing puzzle piece. What have you seen? Jesus didn't stop being who he was because of the storm. Jesus was always who he was. He broke onto the scene. These men followed him. They saw him do all these incredible things. He fell asleep in the boat because he was exhausted. This storm kicked up. He never stopped being Jesus. This storm didn't surprise him. His ability to calm the wind and the waves didn't just pop up. Jesus didn't stop being who he was because of the storm. It's easy to follow Jesus when things are easy. When things are hard. It's hard, but we have to remind ourselves. He calls us to trust him in those moments. And he says, trust me, trust me. And it's hard. I don't, I don't mean, I don't say it like, you know, all preachery or, or because I'm a pastor or because I've been a Christian since I was 16. Trust is hard. And there's moments in my life where I don't, I don't trust God to see me through. I doubt there's a, there's, a, there's a guy in the, in the New Testament and, and Jesus is like, if you just believe, and he's like, I believe, but help my unbelief. And I live in that tension at times. And yet time and time again throughout my life, I've seen that Jesus is profoundly trustworthy. Here's the thing. The, the disciples experienced this storm. And he's saying, where's your faith? Trust in what you've seen. Trust in who I am. Trust in what I can do. Because listen, the promise was the other side. But the other side carried with it even greater challenges, even greater storms, even greater moments of difficulty. I mean, in Jesus' own life, the other side led to his crucifixion, to his death, his burial and resurrection, to his torture at the hands of people. 
that he came to save. Most of the disciples end up dying for their faith. The other side was not a promise of prosperity, but of presence. And that is the same promise that he offers you and me today. Not a life without trouble. I mean, I wish. I wish, right? I wish I could be like the penguins and have great plans and jump in and, and my cheesy dibble plans are good. I grab the dibbles and I get out and I'm, I'm enjoying the dibs. I wish it was like that. I wish I could, I mean, I don't wish I could build a puzzle, but if I was a puzzle builder, if I could build a puzzle and I never ended up with a piece that didn't make sense, I wish life never threw those pieces at me. I wish. But that's not the reality. And you and I know that profoundly. Whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, you know profoundly that life throws things at you at time. I mean, COVID is a great example of that. And all of the moments that we've experienced through COVID, the unexpectedness of it all. Psalm 46, 1 to 3 says this, God is our shelter and our strength. When troubles seem near, God is near and he's ready to help. So why run and hide? So the challenge for you today and the challenge for me today is stop running and hiding from God. Perhaps you're running and hiding because you, you think he doesn't care or he doesn't want to know about your life or he doesn't know, he, no one can understand what I'm going through and he can and he wants to be your shelter and your strength goes on though and says no fear no pacing no biting fingernails when the earth spins out of control we are sure and fearless when mountains crumble and the waters run wild we are sure and fearless yo when the earth spins out of control that's gonna be that's like that's gonna put that in a bumper sticker hey 2020 2021 the years that the earth spun out of control everything that i planned everything that i expected everything that i hoped for And yet, and yet, God is our shelter and our refuge, not, in, not, not, not because of the circumstances we find ourselves in, but in spite of the circumstances we find ourselves in. When this is happening, we can be sure and fearless because of God, because of who he is, because of his presence in our lives. Even in heavy winds and huge waves or as mountains shake, we are sure and fearless. Remember that puzzle piece? Remember that puzzle piece that you have no frame of reference for? Remember that puzzle piece that you don't understand? It doesn't fit. You got no, there's no box cover. You're just stuck there. Some of you are like still stressed out about that puzzle piece. The one that represents your life, that moment or experience or time. And and you don't know what to do with it. Well, I want to tell you today that we can trust in God because he has the box cover. He sees the whole picture. He understands where that thing fits. He understands how he is going to take that broken moment and make it redeemed. Where he's going to take that moment and do something beautiful out of it. Not because of that moment, but in spite of that moment. Listen, what do we do when life doesn't make sense? He calls us to trust in him. To trust And so we trust him today. God, don't you care? Man, this has probably been one of the hardest years of my life, bar none. I have lost two friends who died this year, and there were no funerals. There was no way to say goodbye, no way to have closure. It it doesn't even feel real still. I had a family member, my mother-in-law, end up in the hospital over Christmas. We had all of these great plans for Christmas. On Christmas Eve, she had a heart attack and ended up in the hospital. And we weren't able to go visit her. We, were, we weren't able, to, we, there were times, I remember at 11 o'clock, one of the nights, my wife, with tears in her eyes, called the nurse's station to try and find out, how is my mom? That was unexpected. It didn't make sense. We didn't know why. We had all of these plans and suddenly they were gone. A few months ago, I went through one of the hardest times of my life in terms of anxiety. I struggle with anxiety, but this was, this was something else. I, st- I, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't eat. I ended up going to therapy to try and work through these things. And there were moments, I remember there was this time, I, I, just, I had to just drive. I just, had to, I just had to get away. I just drove. And I was driving in the rain. I was listening to worship music. I was tears in my eyes. And I'm thinking, God, don't you care? 
I, this is too much for me. I can't carry this. I can't bear this. He says this over and over again. And that's what I clung to in those moments, in those times, in those experiences, in those puzzle piece moments or the penguin moments. That I've seen him time and time again in his word and in my life and in the lives of those around me. He says this, yes, my child, I care more than you will ever know. And that is what he is saying to you today. And perhaps you're sitting there and you're thinking, God, do you care? Perhaps you're sitting there with that puzzle piece going, what in the world is this? It doesn't make sense. And God is saying, yes, my child, I care. The child of God, he cares. If you're thinking of becoming a child of God, he wants to adopt you into his family. When life doesn't make sense, Trust him. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you for this opportunity to be here. And I, I just thank you for the chance to share what you've put on my heart. I know this is not easy. I know you, you know my heart. You know the times that I've wrestled. You know the times that, that I have not trusted you. The times that I have questioned. The times that I've yelled up into the heavens. God, don't you care? And I thank you that time and time again I've seen you show up in my life and bring peace, not because of my circumstances, but in spite of my circumstances. And I pray for each person who is watching here today, for those who follow you, those who are your disciples, I pray that you would remind them of the things that they have seen, that they have seen, that you would remind them in their circumstances, in their, their moments, that, that you are a God that loves them. And for those who have clicked play and, and, I mean, don't even maybe know why they're doing this, or maybe they're searching for something, for someone who will understand, who will care, who will be there, who will, who will reach out to them. And I pray that they would see that it is Jesus reaching his hand out, asking them to trust him. I thank you for all that you've done in my life and the lives of those I've seen around me. And I pray that you would do great things Help us, Lord, to trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, and thank you to Jeremy for that incredible insight. I'm really looking forward to the rest of this series, and, and I hope you are too. But be sure to be here for week four. They're all good, but that is the week you will really not want to miss. And as we close out today, we're going to leave you with a trailer. Now be sure to pay attention. You may find a word hidden somewhere in there and you may want to write it down. You may want to make a mental note. It may be important at the end of the series. Check it out and I'll see you next week. No, seriously, pay attention. We're getting nowhere. We should just call it a night. We didn't account for the irregularities. We did. No. No, we did it. It's right here. We just missed it. If we carry the four and use the matrix from our early rendition of that decimal, group these together and apply, apply the, the principle, principle of the pneumatic radian, it equals. 